Hello, my name is Ben Teske from the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters, and I work in the Lake Ontario Atlantic Salmon Restoration Program, also known as Bring Back the Salmon. Welcome to the 2021 Classroom Hatchery Program, where in these two tanks behind me, we're gonna raise 200 Atlantic salmon. The classroom is housed in the OFAH Mario Cordellucci Hunting and Fishing Heritage Center in Peterborough, Ontario. This place is a nature museum. It's really cool and I'm going to show you part of it. Ontario is home to nearly 150 species of freshwater fish. Behind me is the Ontario Record Fish Registry Wall. These are replicas made out of fiberglass of some of the largest fish that have ever been legally angled in Ontario. And they just give us a glimpse of some of the diversity and just the overall size of some of the amazing fish that are swimming around in Ontario. Let's go and check some of them out. We have some familiar fish like this common carp, channel catfish with its whiskers or barbels, some fish that you might not be familiar with, like a bowfin, long-nosed gar with its needle-like mouth, some other familiar fish, like a walleye, yellow perch, some bass, like a large-mouth bass, and a small-mouth bass, Some large predatory fish, muscalunge, northern pike, and above it here, it's a tiger muscalunge, which is a hybrid. So it's a combination between a muscalunge and a northern pike. It's a mix of the two species. We have an aquarium with some live fish in it, some bass and walleye, this large fish here is the largest freshwater fish in Ontario, it's called a lake sturgeon. Down here we have an American eel, also a type of fish. Next to it, we have the focus of our program, an Atlantic salmon. And this is a replica of the largest Atlantic salmon caught in recent times in Lake Ontario. In the past, there may have been larger ones. In fact, there may have been larger ones of all of these species. There may even be still larger ones of these species that have never been caught. So the Atlantic salmon, and around it, are some relatives of the Atlantic salmon. Other members of the salmon family, including coho salmon and chinook salmon, and these two species were introduced from the Pacific Ocean into Lake Ontario, as was the rainbow trout. And then we have some native trout species. It's a brook trout. And this big lake trout, another native species. And this fish right here is a brown trout, which is the most closely related fish to Atlantic salmon that we have in Ontario. It's in the same genus of Salmo. This fish was introduced from Europe, and you can see how closely it resembles an Atlantic salmon. And you'll notice with all of these members of the salmon family, they have differences between each other. But they also have some similarities in the shape of their body and the positioning of their fins. They also all have this fin right here, this adipose fin. So this is the Atlantic salmon, the focus of our program. We're going to go back over to the classroom area. We're going to talk a bit more about the Atlantic salmon and why we're doing this program. 
This here is Sandy, and Sandy's another replica of an Atlantic salmon. Atlantic salmon are amazing creatures. Out in the ocean, they can get up to 1.7 meters long. That's almost as big as I am. They're streamlined, and they're all muscle. They've got these long pectoral fins in the front, and this big powerful tail in the back. And they use these to swim up really strong currents and powerful rivers. They're able to jump rapids and even jump small waterfalls. In fact, another name for this fish is the leaping salmon. And that's because an Atlantic salmon can jump up to three meters high. That's almost as high as a basketball net. So why are we doing this program? Well, for thousands of years, there were lots and lots of Atlantic salmon in the Lake Ontario region. They were really important members of the ecological community and really important food sources for local people living around here. And then, in the late 1700s, their population started to decline. There were newcomers moving here from Europe, and these people had a different relationship and connection to the environment around them. And they started to cut the trees down, deforestation. They were damming the rivers, and they were polluting the waters, and they were overfishing. And these factors combined to cause this fish to completely disappear from the region by the late 1800s. So, now this program is bringing this fish back. We're restoring, which means bringing back, this fish to the region. And we also hope, through the story of this fish, to restore that relationship and connection that people have with nature, that people have with the environment around them. What we're going to be doing in this program is we're going to be putting 100 Atlantic salmon eggs in each one of these hatchery units. We'll be getting those eggs next week. We're going to have the temperature of each unit slightly different, and that's going to affect the rate at which the fish develop. Each week, we're going to come in here, we're going to check on the hatchery, the function of the hatchery, we're going to check on the temperature, and we're going to check on the development of the fish. Then we're going to have different presenters coming in virtually and presenting on topics relating to Atlantic salmon. Those presenters are also going to be uh, sharing some information about the organization they work for, the jobs they have, and the path that got them to those jobs. This week I'm going to be showing you the different parts of the hatcheries and how they're set up. But before I do that, I want to give a shout out of gratitude to our program sponsor, Ontario Power Generation, and a major funder of the Classroom Hatchery Program, Ontario Trillium Foundation. Without the generous support of these two organizations, this program would not be possible. So thank you. Okay, so this is our hatchery unit, and we do have an activity that goes along with this little presentation, and you can find that on our website. And what that activity entails is just labeling each part of the hatchery unit, just describing what the function is, and I'm gonna be telling you what the function is for each part of this hatchery unit. And then there's a third column on there. And that third column has to do with how does nature do this task? These hatcheries are trying to mimic what happens in nature. So I want you to think about that. I'm not giving those answers today. And in a few weeks, we're gonna have a presentation on habitat, so some of those answers are gonna come out then. And we'll take up that sheet after that point. Point. So here we have a tank, and that's obviously going to hold the water. Inside the, inside the tank, there's some gravel. And I want you to think about you know, why we'd have gravel for and the eggs are laid in gravel by the fish, and the little fish, when they hatch out, they, they stay in the gravel. And what would that do for them? Why would they be in this gravel. I want you to think about that. We have this unit here. This is the chiller. This is a really important part of our hatchery. Atlantic salmon are a cold water species. They need the water to be very, very cold. Uh, we're going to run one of these hatcheries at about 4 degrees Celsius and one at about 7 degrees. 
Now, obviously there is no chiller in, in nature, but how does the water get cold in nature? And what are some factors that help keep it cold on a really hot day? How do you keep cool if you're outside on a hot day? I want you to think about that and think about the environment that Atlantic salmon live in. We have a filter. And so this will sit on the back of the tank. And there's a tube here and water is going to be pulled up through this tube and there's going to be a little waterfall coming out of here. And what this does is it filters out ammonia and it filters out, um, it removes toxic ammonia and nitrate, odors, discoloration and impurities from the water. So how does water in the natural environment get cleaned? What are the things that help water to be clean? We have an air pump with an air stone. That's the stone. So this pump is gonna put water, it's gonna put air into the water. And this stone helps diffuse it into the water. Now, fish don't breathe like we do. How do fish breathe? And why do they need air in the water? I want you to think about those questions. Um, we have, this is a power bar, but it's a special power bar. It's a ground fault interrupt, circuit interrupting uh, power bar. That's because we're dealing with water, so we don't want an electrocution hazard. So if this thing gets wet, it'll just shut off. We have an incubating tray. This you will not find, there's no, um, there's no natural component that does this other than the gravel. The eggs would, in the, in the wild, they would go right into gravel. So this here just allows us to be able to watch the eggs develop. And there's little holes in here, little cross hatches with holes. And this will allow oxygenated water to get into those eggs. And so we'll get to watch them. And each one each fish gets a, their own little apartment in here. There's 200 apartments, so we're only gonna half fill each one of these. I'm gonna be adding salt to the water. And um, why am I adding salt? So some of you might think, well, they're Atlantic salmon and the Atlantic Ocean is salt water. And that's a great thought. However, the fish begin their lives, no matter where they live, they, they begin their lives in a cold freshwater stream. We add salt to the water to keep down fungus from growing that might end up impacting the health of the fish, might even be killing them. So this salt just helps to keep the water clean for the fish and healthy for the fish. The last component I have is insulation. So insulation is going to go around this whole unit and obviously that's going to help with efficiency for temperature, but it's also serving another purpose. And I want you to think about what it would be like in Ontario right now in January in a cold water stream. What would the insulation might, what might that mimic in the natural environment in winter time in a stream? So those are the components. I'm gonna add the water now. Now I don't wanna just go and add water that comes out of the tap, um, unless I know it's a good clean source from a well. Uh, city water does have something in it that would impact the fish. Um, and think about what that might be. Your water is chlorinated. And so chlorine would, would kill our fish. So what we do is we add water. We either have to add um, distilled or bottled water that's not chlorinated, or we have to allow this water to sit for three to five days because chlorine will evap evaporate off. So I'm gonna go ahead now and I'm gonna put water in here and then I'm gonna put all of our equipment and get it functioning. Okay, so I've got my water in here, and I've got everything plugged in. My air stone is in the water, my air pump is here, my filter's ready to go. Um, all I have to do is plug it in.
Now this pump is pulling in air right now, so I need to give it some water. Prime it, get the air out, and get it pulling water. Salt. And that'll dissolve into the water. And there it goes, just getting the last air bubble out. Now we got this little waterfall happening. And then I'm going to turn on the chiller. And I have here a thermometer. I'll put that on the edge so we can check the temperature before we put the eggs in. And here goes the chiller. Oh, the chiller's not plugged in. That would help. And there goes the chiller. So we'll let this run for three to five days before we add our eggs. We'll cover it all up with the insulation. And that's it. Before I sign off from this week, just like with the other presenters you're going to hear from throughout this program, I want to tell you a little bit about the organization I work for, the job that I have, and the path that got me to this job. I work for the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters, the OFAH. OFAH was formed in 1928 by a grassroots alliance of conservationists. Today, we're the province's largest not-for-profit charitable fish and wildlife conservation organization. Together with our partners, we offer a broad range of conservation programs. As the voice of anglers and hunters and a leader in fish and wildlife conservation in Ontario, the OFAH strives to ensure the protection of our hunting and fishing heritage and the enhancement of hunting and fishing opportunities. We encourage safe and responsible participation and champion the conservation of fish and wildlife resources which so enrich our lives. We have a vision, a vision of a future that includes healthy lakes and forests, bountiful fish and wildlife, and opportunities for all Ontarians to share in our passion for hunting, fishing, and conservation. So I work at OFAH in the Lake Ontario Atlantic Salmon Restoration Program, also known as Bring Back the Salmon, and I'm the salmon educator. No, I don't teach salmon how to swim. I run education programs like this classroom hatchery program. Now normally this program happens physically in classrooms. In 2020, we were in 75 schools and 10 non-school locations that were open to the public. In 2021, we're having to run this program virtually, but this is actually allowing us to get into more locations than ever before. Now, a little bit about my story. Actually, you know what? This being the virtual world, I'm gonna do this a little bit differently. I think if I were to... Oh no, right, it's this one. Ah, that's much better. I love being outside. So I grew up in Southern Ontario, and after high school, I went to college to study electronics. There is so much opportunity and really interesting work in electronics, but after a few years, I realized that this was not my passion. There were people around me who would go home and build circuit boards after work. I just wanted to play outside. Even as an adult, playing outside is one of my favorite things to do. And I realized that my passion lies in the outdoors and with nature. My interest in nature has taken me on some amazing adventures, both locally, wandering through the forests and paddling the lakes and rivers of Ontario, and globally in places like mainland Australia and Tasmania, the United States and South and Central America. I've been to deserts, the Arctic, and deep into jungles, including the famed Amazon, all because of my desire to learn more about nature watching birds, studying plants, and following the tracks and signs of really cool wildlife like wolves and jaguars. 
I do some fishing, enjoying the time in nature and learning about where different fish live and when they're hungry, but my understanding of fish is much deeper than this, quite literally. I love to snorkel and have spent lots of time under the surface of lakes and rivers in Ontario. As a certified scuba diver, I've done many dives on coral reefs, including the Great Barrier Reef and the Mesoamerican Reef in the Caribbean Sea. Coral reefs are biological hotspots, full of life. Everywhere you look is something amazing. Sea turtles, octopus, jellyfish, lobsters, and tons of fish like clownfish, parrotfish, moray eels, manta rays, barracuda, and sharks. One of my most amazing experiences in nature was on one of these dives. I was on a shark dive off the coast of Honduras, which is a country in Central America. We took about a 20 minute boat ride from, uh, from a small island and, um, and then we jump in the water. And there's lots of surge that day in that location, and surge is this big push and pull, so you get really washed around. And we had to pull ourselves down on the anchor line. So I'm pulling myself down on this line, and I can see below me about 15 to 20 sharks swimming around. Now sharks, like Atlantic salmon, are fish, but they're in a different group of fish. Salmon are in a group called bony fish. So they have skeletal structures that are made out of bone, like we are. Sharks and rays are in a group that are, their structure is made out of cartilage, like what we have in the tip of our nose. So these are Caribbean reef sharks. And like most sharks, they're not people eating sharks. So I pull myself down on this line and then we get in behind this small reef and we're out of the surge and it's calm water. We start swimming around with these sharks and it was amazing. These sharks are swimming all around us. And the guides had, had, had set a really strict rule and that was don't touch the sharks. And I'm usually a rule following guy, uh, especially if I understand and agree with the rule. And in this case, you know, you've got, they're not people eating sharks, but they're up to two meters long. So about almost as long as I am. And um, they, they have a big head with rows of razor sharp teeth. And they also have, covering their entire body, they have scales that are tooth-like. They're tooth-like scales, and that helps them swim really efficiently. And these scales, if you, were to, if you were to pet a shark from head to toe, it would be super smooth. But if you were to pet a shark from tail to head, you could actually cut open your hand. Shark researchers call this shark burn. So it's a good reason not to touch, touch the shark. But I have, at one point, I have this shark swimming right beside me, right over my right shoulder. And I look over and the two guides are looking in other directions. And then I see my hand just start moving up towards this shark. And my brain is thinking, hey, you're not supposed to be doing that. But it was like my hand had a mind of its own. When else am I ever gonna get a chance to touch a shark? My heart, I was so excited, my heart was just pounding in my chest so loud that I thought I, I might scare away all the sharks. And my hand's going up, and just before it makes contact with the shark, the shape of the body was just so that the shark kind of went up and away from my hand. And the thought went through my head, I'm not gonna get it, I'm not gonna get a chance to touch this shark. And then just at that, the shark flicks its big, powerful tail and smokes me in the side of the head. My face mask fills full of water and I was just so pumped. I just got smoked in the head by a shark 20 meters below the surface of the ocean. And it is one of the highlight in my reel of life. Such an amazing experience. I went back to school to study ecosystem management at Fleming College in Lindsay. My interest and passion turned into more than a career. It became my purpose. I realized how important a healthy environment is for all life on Earth, including humans. We all need clean air, clean water, and biodiversity. 
for us to survive and to have a high quality of life. My purpose has become to help others to connect with nature so that they can understand this importance and become better caretakers of the world around them. From college, I went on to owning a nature retreat on the outskirts of Algonquin Park, where I hosted travelers from all over the world so they could experience the natural wonder of this amazing park. I also hosted workshops on wild edible and medicinal plants, wildlife tracking, and bush skills, and led some nature hikes. After eight years of owning this business, I sold it and went on to work for a number of conservation and environmental organizations doing really cool work like bird and plant surveys, planting trees, and teaching people about nature. I even got to fly to a remote site on Great Bear Lake, the largest lake that's completely in Canada, to sample fish at an old mine site. And now I'm here at OFAH teaching people about the story of Lake Ontario Atlantic salmon and how the relationship people had with nature made the environment worse for this fish and many other species of animals and plants and how an improved relationship can create a better future for all of us. This is not just my career, it is my purpose. All right, so that concludes week one of our Bring Back the Salmon Classroom Hatchery program. I hope that you've enjoyed it. I hope that you've gotten something out of it. And uh, don't forget to, to check out the activity that's on our website that goes along with this week's episode. And I hope that you'll join us next week when we're gonna get the Atlantic salmon eggs and we're gonna put them into the tank.